This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board today. I'm hoping you had a a good week. So we normally publish on Friday, so I hope your week has went well and that you're uh, looking forward to today's episode as you're trying to get ready for the weekend. So hopefully you're making money and we're getting ready for the holiday season here. Uh, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about woodpecker control, but first, let me just sort of say that I hope that uh, if you have comments about the show, definitely reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear from you, comments, suggestions for shows, perhaps you have someone that you want me to interview, or if you are simply having a product or a service that you would like to announce, we'd love to have you on the show. Definitely reach out to me again. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Do take a couple of moments, subscribe to the channel, make sure you ring the bell, and uh, we'd love to have you uh, get notified every time we're updating. I won't be doing a podcast on the week of Thanksgiving, so I'm going to take a little time off. And so uh, we'll pick up the following the following week. Uh, also, if you're interested in uh, having me do some training for you, you can definitely reach out to me again at the same email address at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. All right, enough of the uh, introductory materials. Let's get into this week's topic. I wanted to talk a little about woodpecker control techniques and some tips there that may be helpful for you. So why don't we get started with that? So let's talk first about the law. Yes, the law. In other words, just because a woodpecker is bothering your client doesn't mean you just pull out the BB gun and shoot it. Uh, I've actually had a wildlife control professional tell me that he does that. He said, it's too much work going through the paperwork. And yes, I'm sure that at times the paperwork element can be quite uh, troublesome. Most wildlife control operators despise paperwork. If they loved paperwork, they wouldn't be doing wildlife control. So uh, I can certainly appreciate that. But let me tell you something, folks, you need to obey the law. And this is something that really frustrates me. Let me get into one of my hobby horses again. You're not going to change the law by disobeying the law. The way you get rid of a bad law is to enforce it so that you compel people to rise up and change it. Now these are, and I'm not suggesting this particular law needs to be changed. I think woodpeckers have a viable role in our environment. However, I do think there is some some concern that we need to streamline this process a little bit more and that is one of the challenges that we have as wildlife control operators is that it's is that the government really doesn't respect us in some ways and that is we don't get the ability to do certain things faster than a homeowner and i think this is part of regulation so for those of you who are closet uh, libertarians out there here's an example of where the the problem of bad regulation is not solved by no regulation the problem is solved by better regulation so uh, i'm a conservative i'm not a libertarian so but in any event the law is the law if you're out there plinking away at the woodpeckers, you'd better make sure you have the permit because it is a serious offense. Plus, you're going to maybe get the ire of a lot of angry people out there uh, who are not interested in, who don't have the problem with the woodpecker, and that can really give some blowback not only to your company, but also to your client. So why... The client's house. You may kind of get that particular question there. Why is the woodpecker by bothering my house? You know, I've I've had clients, not about woodpeckers, but they'll say that you know God is punishing me. And as a theologian, I would love to explore that particular question: why they believe God was punishing them. But nevertheless, <clears throat> there are at least some biological reasons that we believe, though I the woodpecker has picked 
this particular house. And so one of them is one one of the theories is sound, and that is the woodpecker is hearing the sound of insects. And so sometimes when a woodpecker is pounding on something and they have that hollow effect, they think that there may be some cavities inside, and that would be suggestive of insect presence, and so therefore they would continue to pound in the search for those insects. Uh, another element, of course, uh, and these are basically when they've done sort of surveys of people who've had woodpecker problems, they try to analyze the habitat and the situation. And is there a are there is there a combination of characteristics or elements that makes one house more attractive than another? And so that's where these ideas come from. So we don't have I don't want you to get the impression that I'm giving you here scientific proof we don't have that yet, but what the researchers believe is that we have certainly characteristics that make one house more likely to have a problem than another house. So would the person who changes these characteristics reduce their risk? Perhaps, but the problem is, is that we don't, that, that would be sort of a backward looking we, we don't know. I mean, certainly it'd be worth a try, but there's no guarantee that if they change these characteristics that next year they wouldn't have the same problem again. <clears throat> it's complicated, to be sure, is my point here. So we've already talked about sound. The next issue, of course, is habitat. Typically, homes that are hit by woodpeckers are surrounded by trees. New housing developments and wooded areas are particularly at risk, especially those homes. And this is the third element, that is those houses that are earth tone colored. So the pink house tends not to be attacked by woodpeckers. The browns, the tans, maybe even the grays, those earth tone homes are more likely, or at least statistically speaking, to be hit by woodpeckers. Now the house I have in the photo there out in the middle of basically a field with a little bit of a windbreak, that house obviously is significantly less likely to be attacked by woodpeckers. Plus it's also painted white. So uh, that at least that's according to the research. There's also the possibility that there is certain types of home construction or building construction that is more vulnerable to woodpeckers. And that is, you know, the grooved plywood siding seems to have these sort of gaps in it, I believe. And and that can be attractive. Again, that hollow sound when a woodpecker is banging away at it. Certainly cedar siding, again, those earth tones, again, and redwood siding, again, those earth tones, again, uh, those are obviously attractive surfaces, at least in terms of woodpecker behavior, right? And so, and that's what the research suggests. So let's talk about some control methods here. Notice I'm not talking about anything about woodpecker biology here. We're just going through a little survey of some techniques that could be helpful for you and your clients responding to woodpecker damage. This is something that was uh, put out by, I believe it was the uh, Minnesota DNR, and it's called the Woodpecker Bongo, and it's kind of a clever idea. The idea being is that woodpeckers sometimes peck for drumming purposes. Now, drumming is a characteristic where a woodpecker is basically banging on a surface to achieve a certain sound to sort of declare territoriality or perhaps part of mating process. So it's called drumming, where they're not necessarily interested in cutting into the wooded surface, but they like the noise. And they're letting other woodpeckers know this area is mine, and maybe they're attract looking to attract a mate as well. Well, what this particular device is, is to take advantage of that, but give the woodpeckers something to bang on other than your house. Has it been scientifically tested? No, a lot of these things just aren't. I mean, it would be a pretty hard research project. It would probably take an enormous amount of money and uh, not to mention time. However, it is something that may be worthwhile for you to explore. Even if you build a few on your own, there are instructions on the, just do a search on Richard Hort, and that's spelled H-J-O-R-T. That's Richard Hort, H-J-O-R-T. 
RT. Uh, and you look at the Woodpecker Bongo or even do a Google search on Woodpecker Bongo, B-O-N-G-O, and see if this is something you might want to try. Because maybe if we can crowdsource this a little bit more in terms of crowdsourcing science, maybe if we have enough, enough people playing with it a little bit, maybe we can sort of get some information, say, hey, when did it work? When did it not work? What were the what were the time of years? Got to do a little record keeping, of course. And then there's that paperwork again. Uh, but maybe we can figure out, but I'm just making you aware of it. You may want to turn that on to your client. Uh, there's also something known as the woodpecker house. And that is sometimes woodpeckers are banging on a building because they're trying to excavate a nest. And so you're by giving them an alternative home, you may be able to lure them away from being attracted to the house. Again, is there, you know, do we have evidence of how often this works? Not really, but there is some anecdotal information and you can certainly look up in the Texas Parks and Wildlife where they have some of this information. So you're not going to get you know, the slam dunk. And I know that's difficult sometimes as wildlife control professionals, we want to come in and solve it. We're going to come in and solve it. And I think at times we need to take a little bit more of a medical approach toward wildlife damage. We tend to take a curative to approach, and that's not always going to be possible. And I think we're going to have to try to help our clients understand. That begins with us, by the way, that sometimes wildlife control is not about resolving the problem permanently, sometimes it's managing the damage over time. So Woodpecker House may be something for you to, to look into, certainly to suggest. And again, if we don't know of these particular types of devices and products, we can't give them as options for our clients. And remember, our job is not necessarily to tell the client, you must do this but pro but to provide options that are within the law and that are reasonable for your client to make an informed choice. And remember, these techniques are not necessarily either or. You can have a bongo and a house, a uh, woodpecker house. So it's not an either or thing here. So uh, don't get into this. Sometimes we get a little narrow minded here and we just always oh, got to have one technique, one, you know, that silver bullet. No, no, we need to be a little bit broader than that. And so this is certainly another option for you. Well, while the woodpecker is banging on the building, we need to sort of fix the damage. And so this is sort of a theory that's gone out and I'll have a couple extra slides here shortly. The belief is, and I think there seems to be strong anecdotal evidence for this for some people that have really done a lot of woodpecker work, that is, if you don't repair the damage, it actually makes the house more attractive to woodpeckers. And that kind of makes sense. Think of it as sort of the broken, the broken window theory. If you don't fix the broken window, the people think it's, it's okay to throw, another, throw a rock through another window. Well, maybe that's the same thing that occurring with woodpeckers. And so you want to make sure you're repairing those that those holes and damage as soon as possible, partly because you don't want the woodpecker to develop a nest there, because once there's a nest and you have eggs or perhaps young, now you can't do anything with it until those eggs hatch or the young fledge. Right. That's when they fly away. So you want to be sure you educate yourself and your clients that you want to repair that damage as soon as possible. And if you can repair it in a way that the woodpecker can't peck into that spot again, well, then that lease is a small win for hardening that particular structure. So how do you repair some of these howls? Because you want to do it in a way that's going to be aesthetically pleasing. And I call this the Tim Julian method. He's the, he was a past president of uh, NUCOA. He was the founding president of NUCOA, and he's passed away now. Uh, but he had this particular technique, uh, and so I wanted to give him credit for it. It's certainly not mine. And what he did was he had various types of these uh, drill bits of various sizes and he would measure the size of the hole and then he would take the appropriate drill bit and he would then drill out that hole to make it even, an even circle, and then he would take a plug of a, some plywood, cut a similar hole, cork that hole 
I mean, he's assuming that there's nothing there, right? There's no nesting. There's no nesting, no eggs, no bird inside. You don't want to trap anything inside, right? That'd be a violation of federal law. And then he would uh, cork that hole, and then he would take some wood putty and smooth that out, and then he would sort of roughen, roughen it a little bit so that it would match the coloration of the wood surface and blend it right in kind of an amazing technique to be to be sure so and he and this again he wanted to make that hole disappear and that's for two purposes one for the client of course client wants their home looking nice but also so that other woodpeckers don't become attracted to the house and so tim julian gets credit for this particular idea that woodpeckers are attracted to homes where they see holes and so you want to get those holes fixed as much as possible. Uh, is he correct? Uh, I'm going to take his word for it. I, I, I think he had a lot of experience, and I think he may be on to something. Are there other forms of repair? What do you do when you're dealing with uh, dry vit? I call it dry vit. It's basically that sort of insulative material. It's sort, of, it's sort of fake concrete. It looks like concrete, but if you tap it, it's just a hardened surface with sort of styrofoam underneath it. And there are products to repair those because woodpeckers just chow, I mean, just bang the daylights out of those. And this is something I've never used this particular product. I was doing some research and came across it. I tried to reach out to the company, but was unable to get um, a response from them, unfortunately. But it's known as Beak Guard. Or, excuse me. E-I-E-I-F-S Armor, and that's the company out of, out of Canada. That's the company I reached out to. But there's also another product called Beak Guard, and it's supposed to be a woodpecker deterrent. And it's basically uh, like a hardened uh, paint that you would put onto the surface. And so, you know, check this out. And according to them, it reduces the damage by 70%. Again, it's not perfect, but it could maybe go a long way in terms of resolving that. According to the EIFS Armor, which is an exterior insulation finishing system, uh, they basically harden the surfaces so the woodpecker can't peck through. So you may want to check that out. Other types of repairs that can be made, you have like this is in wooden poles, for instance, you have different types of wood resins because some woodpeckers can really damage telephone poles. Uh, this would probably be something handled more by uh, the electrical company. However, you may have a client who may have their own their own poles, maybe they've done some of their own electrical work and that wouldn't be owned by the electrical company. You may want to point them out to something called Osmo Weld which is an epoxy resin, and you can basically fill it into the holes that are being filled and kind of rehardens and stiffens up that pole because the damage that woodpeckers can do to telephone poles can actually cause those to collapse. So that's pretty dangerous. Now, how do we protect houses? One of, I mean, the gold standard, maybe I should even call it the platinum standard is netting. Uh, you say, Stephen, they don't want to do netting. I understand that they may not want to do a wedding, but the reality is, is that some situations the, the house is getting attacked on a regular basis. It may be something like, you know, just the alternative to Christmas lights. Instead of putting up Christmas lights every year, you're putting up your, your netting in the spring, leaving it to the fall, and then removing it, right? So there are ways to stop that because if the woodpecker can't reach the wood, he's not going to be able to damage it. And so you can look at those photos there that I have. Just a reminder, when you have holes inside the structure, make sure, use a fiber optic scope, use a stethoscope, investigate that hole to make sure there are no woodpeckers or no endangered, or no protected species in those holes, right? I just, you know, make sure, folks, don't make the mistake of closing off a hole and trapping something inside that shouldn't be trapped inside, okay? I just... Do your due diligence, and these fiber optic scopes are not that expensive anymore. Uh, you can get them under a hundred bucks. Uh, do your homework. Make sure before you do anything permanent. How about repellents? Well, there are several uh, repellents out there. Unfortunately, uh, the tactile ones, at least the ones that I looked in, I would welcome feedback from people. Uh, I was not able to find one, a tactile repellent that was labeled for woodpeckers. And so uh, that's a, certainly a problem. Now, remember with bird repellents, we're talking about two different types of 
active ingredients. One is polybutenes, very sticky. The other one is capsaicin, which of course has a burning sensation. Sometimes these two products can actually be mixed in the same item. Uh, I was not able to see anything that uh, was labeled for woodpeckers, but perhaps that's changed since I've done my research. Another product in the market, methylenthranolate, is the active ingredient. You know, that's the same. That's what makes your grape Kool-Aid taste like grapes. Uh, methylenthranolate is an extract from grapes. This is uh, available. It's supposed to burn the trigeminal nerve. There's a word for you of the of the bird. And so it's often used in a fogging system to uh, burn those nostrils and make the uh, make the bird fly away. So it is registered for use against woodpeckers. And it has this particular product. It's called Rejexit, R-E-J-E-X-I-T, TP, like toilet paper, dash 40, Rejexit, TP 40. 40% 40 of the AI, that's the active ingredient, is methylenthranolate. Now, the research shows that it stopped woodpecker feeding on suet. However, it failed when it was applied to wood. Now, why is that? Well, because woodpeckers, when they're pecking wood, are not eating the wood. Well, that makes sense, right? And the other issue that the researchers found was that when you applied it onto the wood, on day one, at the end of day one, 27% of the active ingredient disappeared. It volatilized off. So um, it's not really going to be that effective if you're trying to stop pecking. If you're trying to stop the woodpecker from eating Absolutely, it will work. So you can certainly may want to keep keep hoping we get some sort of repellent, but we haven't been able to find one at least yet that I've been able to find. Ultrasonics, of course, don't waste your time. Uh, if, if you can't hear it, your birds really can't hear it either. How about frightening devices like audio, sounds, and propane cannons? Uh, these can disturb woodpeckers as well as other birds, but they also have the challenge of disturbing your neighbors. So, and if they are used on a repeated basis without some sort of interruption, uh, the birds will habituate to it. So, uh, can it be used in short term? Absolutely. And, but you, again, when we're looking at frightening devices, the goal is to shock and awe the birds. So don't just simply use a sound. You want to use a sound and a visual and other things. You want to try to overwhelm the bird, not just sort of do it step one, step two, step three, because then the bird can harden itself to your behavior. You want to overwhelm the bird. Uh, there's another product in the market called the Sonic uh, Dissuader. Uh, it was tested on pileated woodpeckers. That's a very large woodpecker that can really do some serious excavation. And the beauty of this particular device, the sonic dissuader, is that it can detect when there is pecking. So you don't have the habituation. It reduces habituation problems because it only sounds off when it feels the woodpeckers present. And it emits a predator call. So now you're evoking sort of that fear response. So it's kind of clever. Unfortunately, it didn't cause a reduction in damage in the research that was done with it. In fact, what it found was that the woodpecker, when it heard the predator call, it didn't fly away. It froze. It just held its position, probably because it was looking for the predator rather than just simply flying away. So uh, it wasn't successful. But again, it was only tested on the pileated woodpecker. Sometimes people want to use uh, other types of calls, uh, maybe using certain type calls, but they found that these calls may actually attract woodpeckers to the area. And they also theorize that predator calls may actually cause woodpeckers to be attracted to the area to check out where the, where the predator was. So... I don't yeah the sonic the the sound the the sounds of predator noises or other woodpeckers as a frightening device just wasn't they haven't found one that works just yet. What about audio visual? Again, audio visual is they're using uh, sight and sound uh, like pyrotechnics. These are you know blasters. You just sort of pull the trigger and it fires off sort of a firework that shoots off and then in explodes. Certainly these will frighten woodpeckers away from a particular area. The problem is, is that 
Uh, you have to be able to shoot them in sort of urbanized type areas, which is his own problem. You have fire risk and you also have to be there. So there, there's that problem as well. So not very, not very useful. How about lasers and woodpeckers? Well, uh, there's no scientific research on the use of lasers and woodpeckers, at least not that I could find. However, I did notice that there were some anecdotal reports that they found it effective. Again, you have to be there, pres present. Uh, and so red, green, can be used in low light conditions. Um, make sure you don't shine aircraft. That's very important. But again, it's quite iffy at this point, and I haven't been able to find something that really uh, brings it to another level here. Uh, feel free to respond back. I would love to, you know, there's these, you know, you can, it's hard to keep track of all the research at times. And so if you come up with something, I'd love to hear about it. Mylar tape. Mylar tape is very inexpensive. And it's not necessarily pretty, but it has been shown to have some effect. And so it does in two things. It has that, it reflects light and birds don't like that shininess, but it also can move in the wind. So you have a motion element to it as well. Uh, it's, and it's also extraordinarily inexpensive, which is certainly when many homeowners may not like the look, but it's certainly cost wise, definitely something that you need to try. Ear tape takes that mylar tape up a notch, and there ha is research uh, that shows that it is more effective in that it reduced damage more than prowler owls, bird pro sound systems, scary eyes, suet feeders, and roost boxes. Uh, so it did, it does clearly work, and it certainly looks more professional. It has some. 3D holographic surfaces, and it may be something you want to have purchased and make sure you have it on your truck uh, to do that. Halloween spiders, again, these are motion activated. It's not the spider, I don't think it makes a difference here, folks. It's the fact it's motion activated and that when it's motion activated, it then uh, releases that string and it goes down the side of the house and it will scare the bird away. And so, uh, it's certainly something to be worthwhile when you see them at Halloween time, purchase a few of them, have them, have them in your toolbox. And it has that ability to do both motion sensor and it will move that woodpecker from pecking. So it's definitely cheap enough. Another product, uh, this is produced by a wildlife control operator in Minnesota, and it's called the Intimidator. Uh, this has had relatively good reports from wildlife control operators. Again, not scientific uh, research. However, it does have many of the same characteristics of the ear tape that I mentioned earlier. And it has sort of a professional look to it and it's easy to install. So it's something you may want to check out as well because there's been some good reports about it. So when we're talking about frightening devices, we want to sort of think, shiny, have movement. If you can have sound with it as well, that's a plus. But shiny and movement is certainly going to be the most important combination when you're looking at frightening devices. But understand, none of them are going to work 100%. All right, as we're wrapping up here, I wanted to talk a little bit about the depredation permit. So here's the deal. When you're looking to move towards a depredation permit, this is why when you're called by a client who has a woodpecker problem, you need to document this situation up the wazoo. I'm going to encourage you to take photographs when you of the damage when you arrive and you document how long the client claims to have had this particular problem. Immediately begin to institute those repairs as as you can as well as putting up the frightening devices, and you need to do that in an aggressive fashion. Again, documenting all of your work. And the reason is, is that if you get to a point where those frightening devices are not effective, you're gonna to need to then apply for a depredation permit. You need to basically build a case for the death penalty for that bird. That's how I phrase it because I want wildlife control operators and homeowners to understand that what you're doing, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is not in the business of killing woodpeckers. They don't want woodpeckers killed. They will allow them to be killed if you can justify that this woodpecker needs to go. So you need to build a death penalty case, right? So this is hard. So you need to document all of your non-lethal, less lethal controls. 
Okay. Then you need to go online and go pull down one of these forms, the URLs there on your screen. Step number two is you need to get what's called a WS Form 37. That's a Wildlife Service Form 37. And that's what you need because USDA Wildlife Services has to send out a biologist or the biologist may interview you over the phone and say, OK, I think you've got evidence here and we, we're going to give you. You've done the recommendations that we would have told you to do. That's why you want to have all this documented in advance. You're trying to save a step here and they will give you this wildlife services form 37 that allows you to submit your depredation application to the u.s fish and wildlife service so that you can get a lethal control permit the homeowner or the landowner must apply for the u.s fish and wildlife service bird depredation permit they have to you can help with the application you must have accurate records it permits the Fed to enter the area, so the per landowner is giving up some rights here. So if they're in, uh, just think about that. There's a fee for a business of $100. There's a fee for a homeowner of $50 that's non-refundable. And there's no guarantee you'll get the depredation permit. That's important to understand. You may also have to obtain a state permit. Some states require a separate permit. Other states just claim if you have the federal permit, you have their permission. But I would definitely contact your state and find out what is required for a woodpecker depredation permit. And you want to know this in advance, folks. I mean, don't wait for the client to be calling you because here's how it's going to go. They're going to call you on a Friday evening before a long weekend. That's so have this information on your own. Do a little bit of research when you have a little bit of downtime, make a call to the state, find out what is required for for a woodpecker depredation permit in your particular state. We have already talked to you about the federal permit, but whether or not what do you need to do to satisfy the state law? Because you may need two separate permits because two different agencies do govern the work on woodpeckers. So definitely keep that in mind. Well, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. I am the owner of Wildlife Control Consultant. You've been listening to the Living the Wildlife Pest Geek podcast. Uh, hope you've enjoyed this. We've covered a lot of information here on woodpeckers. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet on woodpecker damage. So if you're looking for one, we don't have it yet. Would welcome your feedback. If you found something that's been useful for you, share it. Do join us on Facebook. We have our uh, community there on our interest group. Sign up for that. Join the revolution, as Franklin calls it. And again, you can reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Would love to hear from you ideas for other shows and that sort of thing. Hope you found this very informative and helpful for you and your business. And again, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.